Hi, welcome to Philosophy Tube. Uh, I teach people about philosophy. Today, we're learning about Charles Darwin. We're going to talk about where he got his ideas, how he impacted the way a lot of us still think about loads of stuff today, and some of the people who took his ideas and did interesting, sometimes horrible things with them. We'll talk a little bit about what Victorian Britain was like. There's some stuff later on about God and religion. And we're also going to touch on eugenics and social Darwinism too. When I started researching this video, I found that it is surprisingly very relevant to current events. Although this video will hopefully just be a nice relaxed ramble through the woods. You'll have seen that it's sponsored, but I'm not going to keep any of that money. If you stick around at the end, you'll find out where I'm donating it. So I've got my backpack, I've got my sunscreen, I've got my water bottle. Let's go on an adventure. We're walking through a quite famous and ancient bit of English woodland. I won't say where exactly, but it's, uh, it's really quite beautiful. You can sometimes see deer in here, and there's a spot a bit further in where you can pick wild blackberries, although it's possibly a little early in the season for blackberries at the moment. But it's really atmospheric. There's a lot of beautiful animal and plant life in the English countryside. And if you and I were walking along here together, in the early 1800s, we might have had a chat on the latest theories about where all this life came from. People back then, they knew about fossils. They discovered the remains of all these weird and wonderful creatures that they knew weren't around anymore, including some dinosaurs. So they knew that life on Earth hadn't always been the way it is now. They could see that species go extinct but they were curious about where new species come from. So what was Charles Darwin's theory? What did he actually say? Well, in a nutshell, uh, he said that a species, like, uh, like wood pigeons, is made up of individuals who all vary ever so slightly from each other. You might think that wood pigeons are all the same, but if you take your time and look close, each individual has different traits. Uh, trait is a word here that means characteristic or property. Nobody at that time knew why animals of the same species vary, but they could see very clearly that they do. And species breed, obviously, which means they increase in numbers. But at the same time, most of them die. Like, a salmon can lay thousands of eggs, but most of them never reach maturity. I mean, they can't do, otherwise we'd all be knee-deep in salmon by now. There's disease and there's predation, a great struggle for survival. That's an important idea, the struggle for survival. Hang on to that one, we're going to come back to it later. And at the same time, we can see that offspring tend to resemble their parents. Like, you know, you, you get two tall people and they have a baby and the baby grows up to be tall. Or you get two spotted wood pigeons and they produce a spotted wood pigeon. You never get, like, two pigeons and they make a jellyfish. <laughs> so there seems to be a kind of general rule that offspring get their traits from their parents. And Darwin realised maybe some of the individuals in a species will have traits that give them a tiny advantage in the struggle for survival. Again, don't know why, but maybe some of the pigeons are born with just slightly different shaped feathers that allow them to fly a tiny bit faster and they outrun the hawk. And they'll be more likely to survive and breed than the pigeons that don't have the special feathers. And since we know that offspring tend to resemble their parents, that means that advantageous traits are more likely to get passed on. And he called this tendency natural selection. Holy crap. Now we know where new species come from. Because if you let that process play out on a long enough timeline, the advantageous traits are always the ones that get passed on, the species will very gradually change. And if it goes long enough, eventually, the organism you end up with will be something totally different than what you started with. And that is where all of this, including me, came from. That's wild, isn't it? I love these, uh, I love these trees just off to the side here. Look at this. Look at how it's all like, it's all bunched up and all carbuncled. It's like a, it's like an old witch who's been imprisoned inside it or something. I don't know how they get like that, but it's really quite pretty. Darwin wasn't actually the first guy to come up with an idea like this. He figured out the natural selection stuff, yeah. 
But even when he was a kid, people were already talking about evolution and discussing its implications. And there was this other scientist called Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who came up with a theory of evolution that was wrong, as it turns out, but was very, very influential. Lamarck was a Frenchman, and he was like, oh, ha, ha, I have solved the mystery. And he said that if an animal acquires a trait during its lifetime, then it will pass that trait on. The classic example is giraffes. You start off with an animal that looks a little bit like a deer, and over its lifetime, it's always stretching up its neck to get the leaves that are just a little bit higher. And after a lifetime of doing that, its neck actually gets a tiny, tiny bit longer. And then it passes that trait on to its kids, and its kids do the same thing. And after enough generations of stretching and stretching, they get really long necks, and you get a giraffe, and that's where new species come from. Uh, and they were wrong. As it turns out, evolution doesn't, doesn't really work like that. Nowadays, we're pretty sure, as far as I know, I'm not a biologist, that uh, organisms don't pass on traits that they acquire during their lifetime. Seems to more be about they pass on the traits that they're born with, like Darwin said. But Lamarckism, as it was called, was a pretty solid go at figuring all this out. So that's Darwin, and that is all Kushti. But the title of the video is Charles Darwin versus Karl Marx. And the most important question is obviously who would win in a fight, to which the answer is obvious. Charles Darwin was a pretty sickly guy, whereas Marx was always getting into scraps and scrapes. He would almost certainly win, unless he was drunk, which he often was. So uh, <laughs> yeah, probably actually it'd be a draw. Darwin puts his theory in a very famous book called On the Origin of Species. It comes out 1859. We know that Marx read it, and like a lot of people, he was very impressed. Eight years later, Karl comes out with his own book, very famous philosophy and economics book, called Capital. And he actually sent Darwin a copy, which Darwin only read the first hundred pages of, which is kind of fair enough, because Capital is a thousand pages long, and the first two hundred are pretty dull. And then it gets to the spicy stuff. So you probably already know that Marx was a communist. So what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> All right, I will, uh, I will try to explain it simply. <laughs> Communists say there's two kinds of people in the world, right? There's the people who get money by working for a living, and there's the people who get money by owning stuff, specifically the stuff that other people make. Like Elon Musk. He doesn't put the Teslas together. He doesn't even design them. He's got other people who do the actual work. And yeah, you know, he, he puts up the capital and he takes the quote-unquote risk but you can throw as much money and as much risk as you want at a sheet of metal. It will not turn into a Tesla. The only reason the whole operation runs is because we're doing the work. He just owns the company, and when they sell the Teslas, that somehow means he gets to keep the lion's share of the money that comes in. And communists are like, that's a silly system. Who came up with that? What if instead, all the people who do the actual work owned the factory together, and then they could share the money between them. So we, we don't really need Elon Musk. He's just like an extra level on the top, kind of siphoning off the cream. We don't really need him. He should go and get an actual job instead of mooching off the work that we do. And actually, if we do that and then we own the factory between us, we can vote on how long we want our shifts to be. We can vote on how we want to invest the profits. We can control the working environment a lot more like, um. Oh, it'll be just like, uh, what's that word? Um, democracy. And Elon Musk goes, no, no, you can't do that, because I own it. It's my property. And the communists go, so, so we're supposed to be living in a democracy, but 99% of the time we spend living and working in an environment that's like a mini dictatorship. You just control it. And you control what happens to all the money. And the only thing stopping us from having full democracy and having a better quality of life for everyone is property law? Well, that, I mean, that sounds like an easy fix. Why, why don't we just reform property laws? And then Elon Musk goes, that's communism, I'm calling the police. I think I'm probably going to have some communists being a little bit cross at me in the comments, because I, I, I know I've simplified it, I know I have, but that's because this video isn't about communism. Just like there were people who believed in evolution before Darwin, there were people who were communist before Marx. There were a lot of people who were like, this job sucks, our jobs suck, we, we want full democracy, we want to get rid of Elon Musk, we don't need him. And a lot of them were actually quite fond of Lamarck. They were like, well, you know, by, 
by struggling, the working people of the world will be improving ourselves and then we'll, we'll pass those traits on. And a lot of them believe that human beings descended from apes. That was an idea that was already floating around before Darwin. And they were like, if we're all descended from apes, that's a pretty solid basis for assuming that we're all equal. God didn't make Elon Musk the CEO of Tesla. We can change society if we want to, man. So, Marx reads Darwin and he's like, oh my God, yes, this guy, he's saying that species emerged through natural laws that can be explained by science. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do with Elon Musk. Marx thought that he could explain loads of stuff about society and answer loads of really big questions by doing a kind of natural laws science look at why does Elon Musk own so much stuff? Like, like how come your job feels like a miserable grind all the time? How come your rent goes up, but your wages don't? Why do we have economic crashes and recessions? Why do the richest countries in the world always have an unlimited supply of tear gas and riot shields, but they can't manufacture enough masks for everyone during a pandemic? And Marx was like, lads, I figured it out. I've done, I've done a science and I've done a natural history, but I've done it on society and it explains everything and it's all in my thousand page book. Starting to get a little bit muddy here. Gonna have to watch our footing, I think. <laughs> Don't want to have filth welling up around my ankles. Speaking of uh, filth, though, what was society actually like back in those days? What was the, what was the vibe in Victorian Britain? Well, uh, <laughs> the vibes were not good. <laughs> At that time, Britain was very, very seriously engaged in invading other countries and murdering people and stealing their stuff. I mean, we, we loved doing it, man. We loved stealing people's stuff. We even loved it so much that we put up a bunch of statues to the people who were best at murdering people and stealing their stuff. And a whole cultural and scientific discourse springs up to try and justify this. So along comes Charles Darwin. He's born into a very, very wealthy family, very, very elite. But he's a bit of a wasteman, as we say in England. Like he studies medicine for a bit and he studies theology for a bit, but He's always goofing off, like he's always going out because his real passion is natural history. He likes being in nature and collecting insects and stuff. So one day he's age 22 and he gets this invitation to go on a boat called the Beagle that's sailing around the world. Mainly he gets invited so that the captain can have someone to talk to who isn't working class. Uh, but Darwin really wants to go. He begs his dad and eventually his dad says, yeah, go on. So he sets off on this voyage around the world that turns out to take five years. And also on board the Beagle, are three Fuegians, that's people from Tierra del Fuego. Their names were Eliparu, Orandelico, and Yokushli. And they had been kidnapped or possibly bought, we aren't really sure, during a previous voyage and taken back to England. And they were, they were exotic curiosities, basically. People were interested in, can we can we improve the savages? Can we civilize them? You know, they were given new names and they were dressed up all fancy and they were taught to use an oven fork and they met the king. People wanted to see, in a kind of Lamarckian way, can we give them traits that we want them to have? And then we can send them back and then they'll pass on those traits to the other savages and that will make it easier for us to exterminate their way of life and steal all of their stuff. And so on the Beagle, these three guys were brought back to Tierra del Fuego. And when they get there, Eliparu, Orandelico, and Yokushli happily rejoin their original society. They're like, oh, thank God, you'll never believe what all of these weird white people are doing in Victorian Britain. Give me back my loincloth, this tie is ridiculous. Much to the dismay of their captors. And this encounter has a strong impact on Darwin. We've got his notes from the voyage and we can see that wherever he goes around the world, he's always very interested in people that he sees as primitive or savage, not always in an unsympathetic way, but always he looks at the world having grown up in this society that thought it was okay to treat other people as if they were animals. And in fact, not only did they think it was okay, the whole economy depended on that happening. But there is this really interesting bit in his notes where he says that although the Fuegians may seem savage, they're very well adapted to their environment. 
They might stick out a bit in London, but they're very well fitted to Tierra del Fuego. So way before he starts talking about Galapagos tortoises and finches and all of the famous stuff you might have heard of in school, we can see that the pieces are starting to come together. But colonialism was not the only vibe that Darwin was picking up on. He was also very influenced by a philosopher called Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus was an English scholar and 11 years before Darwin was born, he wrote a very famous work called An Essay on the Principle of Population, which was hugely influential, and still is, alarmingly, because as we will see, Malthus was wrong. Malthus says there are two things human beings need to continue the species, and they both start with the letter F. Number one is food, and number two is mating. But, he says, our ability to breed is much stronger than our ability to produce food. And he also predicted, wrongly as it turns out, that the more food we make, the more we will breed. And he predicted this can't go on forever. Sooner or later we will exhaust our ability to produce food and we will have an enormous hungry population. And this idea of the struggle for survival, in which not everyone can live, was a major influence on Darwin, who cites Malthus by name a couple of times in Origin. Malthus was specifically interested in humans, though, and, in a very Thanos-like way, he thinks he has a solution to this overpopulation problem. He says that all benefits and aid to the poor should be stopped, and furthermore, that to be poor and dependent on other people is morally disgraceful. He says that providing for those in need will make them wasteful and unable to think of anything but satisfying their immediate desires. The poor all spend too much time in the alehouses, he says, when they should be working hard and saving responsibly, because if we make life too easy for them, they'll breed us into oblivion. I know how to treat the poor. My taxes go to pay for the prisons and the poor houses. The homeless must go there. But some would rather die. If they'd rather die, then they'd better do it and decrease the surplus population. It's rare that people are as explicitly Malthusian as Scrooge these days, but a lot of that stuff is still hanging around. When people talk about overpopulation as if it's the cause of climate change, when they talk about humanity being the real virus, or we need to sacrifice grandma to reopen the economy, or just Thanos in the Avengers, the idea that there isn't enough to go round and so some people, usually the ones who don't have very much to begin with, need to be sacrificed so the rest of us can live, is not true, but a lot of people still think and act like it is sometimes. Good news though, it isn't true. Malthus was just factually incorrect, because we are a lot better at producing food now than we were in his day. We now have enough resources to give food, shelter, and clothing to every human being on Earth. We could even increase the population some, and we would still have enough. The idea that we are overpopulated, or there are too many mouths to feed, or there isn't room, is a myth. He was also wrong when he predicted that birth rates would just keep rising. A lot of affluent countries, including mine, have seen their birth rates falling or holding steady for a while now, for a lot of reasons, one of which is that we have reliable birth control. But this isn't facts tube, this is philosophy tube. And there are some even more interesting philosophy problems here. Because philosophy is kind of like jazz. It's less about the arguments you make, it's more about the arguments that you don't make. And Marx might point out that Malthus conveniently misses a lot of stuff. He rails against the poor who spend their money on beer instead of saving it responsibly. But the idea that working in the Tesla factory might make you so miserable that you spend your money on instant gratification just to feel happy doesn't seem to occur to him. The fact that saving money is no guarantee of anything, because rich a-holes can tank the economy and wipe your savings with no consequence to them, so why would you bother saving in the first place, also doesn't occur to him. He seems to think that poor people are just fools rather than perfectly sensible people operating inside a framework that he has never seen the inside of. He also doesn't seem to seriously consider the possibility of redistributing resources. He says there isn't enough food, and there isn't enough food for everyone to eat like a lord, fair enough. But Marx might say that we don't have to have lords. Malthus says that everyone, including rich people, should have fewer children. But he misses the fact that rich families with fewer children 
still consume more resources than poorer families with more children. Most human beings have and consume very little, and the danger is coming from a tiny number of people who own everything who consume the rest of us off a cliff. Malthus treats that situation as unalterable, and Marx would be like, well, actually, if we had full democracy, we could change it if we wanted to. No, wait, Elon, don't call the police again! Malthus's doctrines are still useful to explain away the disasters of the wealthy as the biological and moral defaults of the poor. Through a Malthusian lens, redistribution looks ludicrous. If there is simply not enough to go around, no system of resource distribution will solve the problem. All of this is rather convenient, if you're the one with the resources to start with. So, Malthus is often portrayed as this cruel, inhuman Scrooge, or a lackey of the bourgeoisie, as Marx called him. But I want to emphasise that he was also a Christian minister, and I think that might help explain why he believed this stuff and why he didn't see the problems. Malthus says that we should remove all the social safety nets so human beings, who are naturally lazy and irresponsible, will work hard. And by working hard, they will not only be happier, but also worthy of heaven. His last two chapters in particular talk about how the struggle for survival inspires Christian virtue, and how all this cruelty is ultimately for the best, because we have a chance at eternal life. There's a spiritual idea here that hard, painful work is what you are on earth to do, an idea that Marx would strongly disagree with. I think we need to read Malthus as a theodicy. A theodicy is a technical term for an argument that tries to explain why there is evil in the world, but why God still exists and loves us. And given that Malthus had such a religious outlook, it's kind of ironic that he ended up influencing Darwin. I've stopped for a bit of a break. It's always important to stay hydrated when you're on a hike. Mm. Refreshing. So Darwin was very influenced by Malthus. There's all that stuff about sex and death and the environment, but his theories also had profound implications for religion. And the reason they did is that Darwinism seems to show that we were not designed. We weren't created. I mean, I, I studied Christian theology at university and I was told that humankind was made so that we could know and love God and through his son Jesus eventually come to occupy a state where we exist with God forever in the afterlife. That's, that's the meaning of life, that's what I was told. And Darwin showed that the first bit of that, the idea that we were created, isn't true. The fact that natural selection happens on its own is a very serious challenge to the idea that humanity has any kind of divine destiny. And in his time, as now, there were people who said, well, how can all of this have come about by chance? There's an example I've seen somebody use where he says, oh, if I, if I look at my fridge and the fridge magnets, the letters, they're all jumbled up, then it's fair to say that someone's just chucked the letters on there randomly. But if I look at it and it spells out a message like, please buy some milk, then then I know that someone put that there. There's no way that happened by chance, right? And this is based on a very old misunderstanding of what chance and randomness actually mean. Variation does happen by chance, but natural selection is not random. It's not random that the slower pigeons get eaten. They get eaten because they're slower. Natural selection is a kind of filter that weeds out all the, all the variations that don't survive as effectively. So, if we were chucking fridge magnets at your fridge, but they're special magnets that only stick to the fridge if the message makes sense, then we would actually expect to see messages that make sense. And in Darwin's day, there were some who came back and they said, okay, you don't know why variation happens though. You've not figured that one out yet. You know, maybe natural selection is a godless process, but perhaps God is, is controlling evolution behind the scenes. Maybe God is where the variations come from. Nowadays though, we do actually know where the variations come from. They come from genetic mutation. And the thing about mutation is, just because a mutation would be useful doesn't affect its chances of happening. You might think that if we take a bunch of mice 
and we put them in a very snowy environment, and then we hop in our TARDIS and we travel forward a million years, there's going to be a bunch of adorable woolly mice running around because they'll have mutated thicker coats, and the ones with thicker coats that keep them warm will have survived and reproduced. But no, it's very possible that we get to the future and there's just a bunch of dead mice because the genetic mutation that would have caused them to develop thicker coats just never happened. Just because a mutation would be useful doesn't mean it's going to happen. And most mutations are actually harmful or neutral in terms of your chances of surviving. So again, the processes that produced all life, including us, don't require a designer to keep going. So theism, the position that there is a god who created us for a reason and loves us and cares about us, might be in serious trouble. Not that there aren't replies to this, and not that it isn't still a very popular position, including with evolutionary biologists, it must be said. So if that's how you want to live your life, then hey, no worries. Okay, that was a nice lunch break, but I think it is probably time to keep going. Ooh, someone's been building spooky structures in the woods. I've seen Blair Witch Project, I know you shouldn't interfere with stuff like this. <laughs> Religion wasn't the only controversy that Darwin became embroiled in. Darwin was a Whig, that's W-H-I-G, and so were most of his family. They were a political party, the Whigs, and in his lifetime, their ideology came to dominate British society, to the point where, even today, a lot of people's ideas in Britain about what society is and what it's capable of have descended from, or evolved from, you might say, Whig philosophy. And in the 19th century, they believed in things like free market competition and free trade. Uh, they supported the abolition of slavery, and they wanted this society in which everyone was on equal footing and everyone could compete. They thought that would lead to the best outcome. Marx and the Marxists, not a big fan of this idea. Not the freeing the slave stuff, they were obviously in support of that, but they did some natural laws and some science, and they predicted that if you have free market competition and free trade, then over enough time, it will funnel wealth into the hands of a smaller and smaller group of Elon Musks. The advantages of free markets will then begin to become undermined as that group of people tries to hold on to their money and power. I did a video about this a while ago talking about the video game industry. They predicted that it would happen over a century ago. So the Whigs had this egalitarian spirit, like kinda, like ish. Darwin was also very against slavery, for instance, but they had also read a lot of Malthus and they wanted to get rid of all the benefits and all the aid for the poor. And they pretty much succeeded. During Darwin's lifetime, this philosophy became government policy. They really did strip back a lot of the social safety nets. And it didn't work because what it actually does is intensify competition for jobs by putting the squeeze on the poor so wages go down, profits for Elon Musk go up, but everyone else is kind of miserable. So miserable, in fact, that these policies were very unpopular. There were riots. There was a general strike in the 1840s. The British army and the police were sent in, and they just murdered working class people in the streets. Uh, and the right-wing press took the side of the murderers. Meanwhile, to Darwin's left, there were these radicals and these socialists and these atheists <laughs> who were saying that Malthusian policies were cruel and unnecessary. And also remember, they were the ones saying human beings descended from apes and so we don't need divinely appointed Elon Musks. And Darwin was kind of caught in the middle because scientifically he agreed with the radicals, but he was also a Whig. He owned property in terms of his social circle and his personal beliefs. He supported the Whig establishment. And in this atmosphere, Darwinism was downright dangerous, in the same way that global warming is kind of a dangerous idea now because it, it, it kind of makes it look like the people in charge of society shouldn't be in charge. <laughs> and Darwin delayed publishing for a long time because of this. Where he succeeded was not just figuring out the actual mechanism of natural selection, but also framing it in such a way that it didn't seem too radical. When he did eventually put out Origin of Species in 1859, decades after he'd started working on it, he very deliberately did not comment on human evolution. And there's a lot of Malthus in there. So he wrote a version of evolution that the middle class could kind of roll with. Again, kind of like global warming, you know, you can frame it in terms of we need to do communism now or everyone on earth will boil. 
And even if you're right, Elon Musk is still going to call the police. Or you can be like, hey, why don't airline companies promise to plant some trees by 2075? And the establishment goes, oh, okay, cool. So we don't actually have to change anything then. And in particular, there was one establishment philosopher who was just waiting for someone like Darwin to come along. And that guy's name was Herbert Spencer. Herbert Spencer was a philosopher alive at the same time as Darwin. He published his famous book Social Static just a few years before Darwin brought out Origin, and he too thought that all social safety nets and aid for the poor should be scrapped. He supported what's called laissez-faire, where you have a small government that doesn't do a lot of regulations or interference cause they'll only end up messing it up. Government, he says, is a necessary evil at best. And Spencer was very influenced by Malthus. He kept a lot of the stuff about hard work being what you're here to do and the brutality all being part of a grander plan, but he wasn't a Christian and he cut out all the religious stuff. The poverty of the incapable, the distresses that come upon the imprudent, the starvation of the idle, and those shoulderings aside of the weak by the strong are the decrees of a large, far-seeing benevolence. So, by the time we get to Spencer, this idea that hard work is your lot in life has been secularized. With Malthus, you have a miserable life of toil, but maybe you get to go to heaven afterwards. With Spencer, nah, you have a miserable life of toil, but markets and competitions and wars are ultimately good for society. Even though Spencer's ideas were around before Darwin published, nowadays we would call them social Darwinism. The idea that we just need to step back and allow competition and that will improve society, even though it means there will be some losers. And when Darwin published Origin, Spencer was all over it. Like Marx, he too went, yes, everything I've been saying, it's all right here. Science vindicates my ideas. Competition and struggle means progress. Survival of the fittest. Spencer reminds me a little of some modern conservatives. I'll be keen to hear from conservatives in the comments. If you think I'm way off, please tell me. But he's not saying that things have to stay the same. On the contrary, he's saying the opposite. Things will change naturally and for the better if we use a light touch and don't do a lot of government regulations because they always mess things up. There's a British science writer called Matt Ridley who wrote a book in 2010 called The Rational Optimist in which he says basically that society will evolve and progress naturally with the help of the free market if we just stand back and don't jump in to mess it up. And if you're the sort of person like Spencer or Darwin or Malthus or Matt Ridley who is born pretty near the top of society and generally improves your lot in life over time, then we can see how that makes sense. Why mess with a system that for you and everyone you know seems to be working? Matt Ridley is a Viscount. He inherited his land and his title and his position as the chairman of a major bank in my hometown, which he then crashed, destroying thousands of people's jobs and wiping their savings. And he didn't go to prison or lose his mansion. He's a famous author now and was made a Lord it seems strange to me that a man like that could espouse the value of free markets when as far as I can see he's never been near one in his life, but <laughs> of course he thinks that things will just improve if we don't do anything. Nobody's ever forced him to face consequences before and his life just keeps getting better and better. If you believe that evolution is a process of improvement, then you will understandably not want anyone to mess with it. But here's a counter argument you could make. Evolution doesn't really make progress in the sense that we think of technological or moral progress. It doesn't improve anything. Every organism on Earth is already about as well adapted to its environment as it can be. They have to be, otherwise they'll be dead. You might think, oh, pandas aren't very well evolved. They only eat one thing and it takes them ages to breed. But pandas have been on Earth for 20 million years and it's not their fault that they're dying out, it's ours. Evolution is not a process of improvement, it's a process of change diversification and specialization. People in Victorian England might have liked to think of themselves as more evolved than Fuegians, but that's not really how it works. Spencer might have thought Darwin's ideas vindicated his philosophy, but it's a bit of a reach. Spencer wasn't completely heartless though. He says, of course, 
This seems harsh, and of course people want the government to help the poor. That seems like it's the compassionate thing to do, but if a mother only gave her child sweets out of compassion, we wouldn't say that was good. And if a doctor refused to perform a necessary operation out of compassion because it would be painful, then we wouldn't say that was good either. I think you can sometimes tell quite a bit by the examples that a philosopher uses. Spencer says that private charity is great, but people who want the government to help the poor are like irresponsible parents or cowardly doctors. And that's quite telling, because that means he thinks poor people are like children or patients. Those are both situations in which there's someone in a position of authority. Spencer identifies with that person and wants you to identify with them too. Whereas Marx might say, why is it your decision what happens to the poor? Why isn't it their decision? In contrast to the social Darwinists who said things can only get better, Marx tried to offer a different perspective and say, no, look, this is what it's actually like when you have to work for a living. The struggle for survival is getting worse for most people. And when progress is made, it isn't because the market evolves it, it's because they refuse to go back to work until their demands are met. Poetically, Spencer and Marx are buried opposite each other. The opposite of progress, of course, is degeneration or going backwards. And as soon as Darwin published Origin, a lot of folks with social Darwinist values suddenly got very worried about degeneration. And they opened the book on one of the darkest chapters of the 20th century. Did you know there's a mathematical formula for making the perfect cup of tea? You must heat the water to 82 degrees Celsius. That's 180 Fahrenheit for all you Americans. And you must let it sit for eight minutes. Oh, perfect. There's something very comforting about a cup of tea. You know, as a parent, you want the best for your child, don't you? Want to give them every ease and comfort in life, and certainly to protect them from making any sort of permanent decision that might weaken their chances in life. There's a terrible fear that comes with parenthood, the fear that something beyond your control might happen to them. That despite every effort, the apple might fall far from the tree. And even though it isn't your fault what they choose to do with their life, you blame yourself. I'm sorry. I suppose it's on my mind because ordinarily I'm a traveling salesman. I like to get about all over, but because of this virus business, I've been stuck indoors, reconnecting with my family. And with that fear, I think about my, son, my, my, my daughter, my little girl, She's having some trouble finding who she is. And I worry for her. You know, a while ago, I was on a farm, nattering away to the farmer, and he was explaining how they can breed animals with certain characteristics. You know, you, you breed a bigger cow and you get more roast beef out of it, that sort of thing. It took millions of years for them to evolve naturally. But now, in a few generations, we can improve them. Isn't that ingenious? And I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be a relief if we could do that with people? If we could... 
improve ourselves in the same way. We could raise an entire generation of Einsteins or Churchills. I think it would be an enormous comfort to a parent to have the power to select the best possible future for one's child. It's taken millions of years for mankind to progress to where we are. But now it seems that progress has stopped. We aren't out with the lions and the tigers anymore. We're all stuck indoors. Natural selection doesn't apply. Oh, the population is ballooning. Some people can't seem to take responsibility for their reproductive habits. But genetically, we aren't going anywhere. It's more a sort of stagnation. And that's not good for the nation, is it? Not to mention the expenditure. My God, look at this virus. How much it's costing us to keep large numbers, mainly economically inactive numbers, alive. Oh, it's terrible, of course. In an ideal world, we would have enough for everyone to earn their place. But there simply isn't any slack in the system. Human history is one of sacrifice. And I think it's naive to assume that we can create a society that lasts a thousand years without sacrificing a few a few things. Do you have a match? Eugenics was developed by Francis Galton, who was Charles Darwin's cousin. In a nutshell, it's the idea that people with good traits should reproduce more, whilst those with bad traits should reproduce less. Galton worried that natural selection had stopped operating on humans. He thought that people with inferior traits, who would otherwise have died because they weren't fit to survive, were being kept alive through things like vaccination and insane asylums, and were in danger of outbreeding the superior people. He believed that traits like intelligence, morality, and even whether or not you're likely to break the law, could be taught, yeah, but were strongly biologically heritable. Heritable means capable of being passed on to children. So far, not too different from social Darwinism. There's similar stuff here about there not being enough competition these days and worries about unfit people breeding, but where Galton took the next step was he wanted society to change so that we could artificially select for the best traits. He was a little bit fuzzy on the details, but he thought we should begin by gathering data on families and their traits. And to do it, he pioneered some statistical techniques that mathematicians still use. If a 20th part of the cost and pains were spent in measures for the improvement of the human race that is spent on the improvement of the breed of horses and cattle, what a galaxy of genius might we not create? Again, this isn't facts tube, but uh, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that the science here is dodgy. Even prehistoric humans cared for their sick and injured. It's not a modern civilization thing that somehow stopped evolution. Arguably, we evolved to do it. As mentioned before, evolution doesn't make progress, so the idea of degeneration or backwards progress isn't supported. And a lot of the science that's been done to try and prove that things like intelligence are heritable is very questionable. So, the usual story with eugenics is that Galton invented it, and he perverted Darwin because he just wanted to be racist. And then it really caught on in the USA, where they forcibly sterilized tens of thousands of their own people because they believed they had inferior genes. And then the Nazis copied the Americans and took it one step further and started exterminating people they thought were inferior. And when the rest of the world found out what the Nazis had done, we were all so horrified that we stopped doing eugenics. That's the version I was taught. 
And it turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. Eugenics meant a lot of very different things to different people. You might have heard the phrase nature versus nurture. Some eugenicists disagreed about how much traits really were determined by biology or nature and how much they were down to society. Some of them did say that race is a reliable predictor of inferiority. Others said, no, race has nothing to do with it. Anyone can have inferior genes. Some of them said it was horrible to contemplate doing eugenics in their own countries, but that it was fine to do it to foreigners. They also disagreed about how much violence they thought was okay. Some of them supported forced sterilization. Others just wanted to imprison the ones they thought were inferior. Some of them supported racist immigration laws to stop the racially inferior from coming in. So it was a very broad class of views and ideas. There were feminist eugenicists who said women shouldn't be pressured into marriage because it allows men with inferior traits to reproduce. There were anti-feminist eugenicists who said women should have as many babies as possible to better the superior population. There were white supremacist eugenicists like the Nazis. And in New Zealand, there were Maori eugenicists who worried about the inferior genes of Chinese immigrants. Darwin definitely had some eugenic ideas, but as a Whig, he would have opposed the eugenics of the USA and the Nazis. The United States did get very violent with racist immigration laws and forced sterilization, it's true. But when discussing eugenics, it might be a mistake to only focus on forced sterilization. For one thing, countries like New Zealand, Australia, and the UK very nearly legalized it. Winston Churchill was really pushing for feeble-minded people which was a catch-all term for the criminal, the mentally ill, and often LGBT folks, to be forcibly sterilized so that they couldn't pass on their inferior genes. The fact that these countries didn't pass sterilization laws was often more down to luck than lack of desire. And in some cases there was no law, but they just did it anyway. The Nazis did go in hard on eugenics, and they did copy it from the Americans. They started out sterilizing anybody with conditions like blindness, deafness, alcoholism, or who was mixed race, and then they moved on to just murdering about 200,000 disabled or institutionalized Germans, and then they worked their way up from there. But it might also be a mistake to think that eugenics went away after the Nazis. The word is pretty much tainted. Yeah, no one calls themselves a eugenicist anymore. But a lot of people still think like Malthus and the social Darwinists and still think it would be good science or ethics to control who breeds. The United States still coerces prisoners into being sterilized to cut jail time. Countries like Finland and Japan still sterilize transgender people. And that is eugenics. You are inferior. And we do not want you to breed because you will make more inferior people. Who is inferior? And who is superior? And who gets to decide that? And what if the inferior people don't agree? Marxists were divided on eugenics. A few of them believed in it. They did say, we don't know how many folks with superior genes never get a chance to shine because they're born working class, but that's not objecting to eugenics on moral or scientific grounds. They just didn't think Elon Musk should be in control of it. Other Marxists were very against it, like trade unions here in the UK. They knew from experience that the police were much more likely to arrest working class people and call them degenerates and criminals than rich people. They didn't much fancy getting arrested for nothing, as usual, and then also sterilized. And interestingly, Marxism can provide a strong critique of eugenics. But in order to explain it, I'm gonna have to make you breakfast. Welcome to my kitchen. Sorry, it's a little bit of a mess. I share it with three other people. Let's learn about fetishes. This is an egg. It's egg time. Marx talked about fetishes, but he didn't mean like a sexual fetish. He meant an object that is used in a ritual and is thought to possess spiritual power, like a voodoo doll. Again, like Darwin, he was picking up on the colonialism vibe, because the idea of a fetish was invented by anthropologists who wanted to believe that West African people were incapable of abstract thought and needed a literal object to represent their beliefs. Like, 
Oh, how silly. They're worshipping the statue. Let's steal all their stuff, and then I'm going to pray to a crucifix and eat a communion wafer, which definitely aren't fetishes because of reasons! And Marx was like, well, there's no reason a fetish object has to be used in a religious ritual. Like, the statue of Churchill in Parliament Square is used in all kinds of British rituals. It represents an idea, it's thought to be very significant and powerful, but just not in a magical way. So, <laughs> breakfast. There's a play called Young Marx about Karl's life. Charles Darwin is a character in it. And there's a brilliant scene where Marx is cooking breakfast for his family. And he suddenly has an epiphany and he says, I don't know who laid this egg. And his daughter says, Chickens lay eggs, daddy, not people. And he says, no, no, no. The point is, in the olden days, like, say, under feudalism, I would know the guy in the village who made these sausages. I would know the chicken keeper who kept the chickens who laid the eggs. A sausage could explain my life. It's a map of my social relations and a reminder that I am connected to my fellow human beings. But nowadays, no, 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 no. Those social connections aren't there. I have no idea who provided my breakfast. My only point of contact with the people who worked to make it is cash. And cash tells me nothing about my connection to my fellow human beings. It circulates everywhere. I don't have those connections anymore. I am, in a word, alienated from them. Instead of an interaction with a person, I get product. And after a lifetime of being surrounded by products, I forget about the people, but they're all still out there. The only reason this food exists is because somebody worked to provide it. I'm not talking about the people who owned the farm. I don't mean the Elon Musk of farming, no. I mean the people who took care of the animals, who turned them into food and delivered them. What are those people's lives like? Are they paid enough? Are their working conditions safe? What are their problems? What if we have the same problems? What if our problems have the same political causes? Isn't that a dangerous idea? I'm putting hot sauce in my omelette, and the hot sauce is communism. The commodity has become a fetish. The thing that can be bought and sold in exchange for money has taken the place of people. We are no longer a society of human beings. We're a society of things. Also, Marx doesn't really talk about this, but there were also some animals involved here. Did they get a good deal? Did the chicken get a good deal? Probably not. Don't ask questions. Just consume product and then get excited for next product. Okay, that's commodity fetishism. But what does it have to do with eugenics? Well, we can do commodity fetishism with traits or genes. The trait, like intelligence or the gene, is like a product. We fixate on that, and we forget that the only reason it has any value at all is because it's inside of a person. For example, there's a great book by Native Studies professor Kim Tallbear called Native American DNA, in which she says that a lot of DNA ancestry companies market themselves to people who think they might have indigenous ancestry. Like, hey, you can discover what tribe you belong to. You can find out your roots. Maybe you could claim that you're a minority. But even assuming that the science is good, and sometimes with these companies it's just pfft, Tribal membership isn't genetic. Every tribe has their own citizenship rules. You can have the ancestors but not be part of the living community. Just because you've got the DNA doesn't actually mean a fat lot because your genes cannot tell you who you are. This is fetishism, she says. It's taking people and hiding them and replacing them with product. And if you send your DNA to an ancestry company, who owns that data? Do they sell it to Elon Musk Pharmaceuticals? Do they share it with the police? Remember Galton wanted to gather all that data on families so scientists could do statistical analysis with it? Gathering data is a form of surveillance. 
In order to do it, you have to be in a position of power over the person whose data you are gathering. Can they say no to that surveillance? If they do, can they still participate in normal life? Are the data gatherers elected or are they dictators? If they lose it or there's a security problem or they misuse it, can we vote them out? Don't ask questions, just consume products. Not that you have to be a Marxist to object to that. Disability rights activists, Marxist and otherwise, have long-standing objections to eugenics for obvious reasons. The philosophy of the disability rights movement is a bigger topic than I have time to get into. It would take a lot of research that I haven't done to do it justice, and I would rather own that than throw something slapdash out and convince you I'm an authority. But if, like me, you are ignorant and curious, there's a free link in the description to a very easy article by a writer called Mel Bags that I found very interesting. I wish I could give you a neat and easy way to avoid commodity fetishism, and if this was a BBC documentary, I'd probably wrap up with something like this. So next time you buy a box of eggs, why not take a moment to thank Britain's hard-working farmers, giving us high-quality produce exactly when we need it. But it doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Marx didn't think that commodity fetishism was something we'd be able to overcome as individuals, but rather that we would have to very drastically change society. After Karl Marx died, his buddy Engels compared him to Darwin, said he was like the, the Charles Darwin of politics. And in a way, he was probably more right than he could have known. Both men were very much shaped by colonial Britain. Both of them had thousands of people coming after them, adding to what they said and modifying it and being inspired by it and occasionally doing horrible things on the basis of it. Both men have had huge and ongoing impact on, on society today and uh, impact that I think we've yet to see the full extent of really. And I think it's worthwhile to trace the ancestry of big philosophical ideas because now you know how these guys came up with their ideas and you can see at every little stage that it might have worked out a little differently. And now you can be like, well, would I have thought about it that way or would I have thought something else? And I think that's quite intellectually empowering. Oh, hey, you know how uh, in my last few videos, whenever I quote a philosopher, the text animates onto the screen? Uh, I got a special computer program to learn how to do that, but <laughs> it's actually really hard. I very nearly spent quite a bit of money on a, on a course, like going on a course to learn how to do it. But then, do you know what I did? I went to Skillshare. You've probably seen them sponsoring YouTube videos before. They're an online learning community. They've got thousands of videos you can watch and you can learn how to do new skills. A lot of them are geared towards creative people. So I looked at their videos on After Effects and on text animation and I learned everything I needed to learn. It was genuinely very useful. Normally, membership of Skillshare is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription, but there's a special link in the description and the first thousand people to click it will get a two month trial of Skillshare Premium absolutely free. I don't think I'm allowed to say how much they gave me, but uh, I'm not keeping it anyway. I'm donating it all to the Knights and Orchids Society. They're an organization that helps black LGBT people in rural areas specifically of the American South. I figured that a lot of the attention lately has gone to black and queer people in major cities. so. I wanted to send some love to my fellow queers in the countryside. Right, well, uh, I'm almost out of water, so probably time to head back. I've got no idea where the f*** I am. <laughs>
It's time for egg. <laughs> 